What's going on, Packers fans? Aaron Nagler here, joined, as always, by Andy Herman of the Pack a Day podcast, giving you stuff over at Packer Report everywhere across these internet streets. Andy Herman's covering the green and gold. Andy, how are you today? I'm doing great. This was a uh, very bizarre game to try to break down. I don't know how you're coming to terms with it, but like, it just feels like uh, yeah. one of those games where if you ask 10 different people, they're going to have 10 different feelings. I have a yep. feeling if I watched it five different times, which thank God I'm not going to do, <laughs> um, I would have five different feelings coming off of it. It's just a really bizarre, interesting game to try to get a, a feel for. It really is. And what's funny, you mentioned multiple viewings and I'm on my all 22 viewing now. I did yep. my, Same. I did last night, I did the kind of full rewatch. And then this morning I did the, the condensed version and now I'm doing going through all 22 because I find that when you do watch it initially, obviously during the game, it's so kind of you're invested emotionally, et cetera, as a Packers fan. And yep. I understand afterwards, it's like, all right, I got to put that away and I try and look at it kind of dispassionately. But I still find this week, more so than the other three weeks so far, really getting frustrated with some of the ideas, seemingly, because obviously we don't know the calls, et cetera, but seemingly some of the, like just the approaches on both sides of the ball. And We'll start on the defensive side because you and I had our little back and forth this morning on Twitter.com. And to your point that you made in the tweet I responded to, absolutely. This the the idea that like after the game, you can look at it and say, on balance, pretty good performance. I, I don't think that you would call it a great performance by any stretch of the imagination. For sure. But certainly not like, you know, uh latter day Dom Capers bad. You know, it's uh, there are certainly you know, comparisons you can make to you know, defenses in the past where you can say, well, this is a vast improvement. But at the same time, and as I noted in my response, that's a stretch of football there at Lambeau Field on an October afternoon where you have a lifelong defensive coordinator calling plays for a third string quarterback and they are marching up and down the field and scoring touchdowns. What? Yeah. That's just a depressing thought, no matter how you parse it. That's totally true. And, and let's start. So let me start with my, my tweet during the game, but the, the emotional response, right? Which right. by the way, I stick by. So I said, green Bay's inability to stop the run against a team with a third string quarterback is inexcusable. You had to expect this coming in with Hoyer starting that quarterback. Yeah. I don't care if it's Hoyer, Bailey Zappi. There's no it difference. Doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't 100%. matter. You knew it's not you like knew what the game plan was going to be. Exactly. I can understand if like you're going against Patrick Mahomes and expecting four <laughs> wides and like a, you know, nuclear yeah. offense. And then and all of a Andy sudden Reed just buttons it up and starts power running. And you're like, what? Exactly. And you're like, OK, you know, how do we transition? Like this has had to be what you expected all week long. So I think with the first and foremost, as you mentioned, that there was some poor performance, specifically those two drives in the second half where they go back to back touchdowns where you know what's coming and you just can't stop it. And that is frustrating. And there's no two questions about it. So once we understand that there is some really bad defense at play here for stretches of this game, I think we can also look at the fact, and that's like the, the, the micro, right? The macro is if you like zoom everything out. Mm -hmm. And if I would have told you like going into the game, regardless of who's at quarterback, the defense allows 17 points under 300 yards of total offense, gets four big sacks, gets a huge turnover, four sacks and limited passing opportunities nonetheless. Yes, right. a, a huge force fumble turnover and like, you know, 100-ish yards passing, no huge explosive plays. I'd have been like, okay, like that that doesn't sound so bad. Like you can probably sign me. I don't, third, fourth, fifth string quarterback. I'm not really too concerned. Like I would probably take that more often than not in the modern NFL. So the, the, the last thing I'll note too is that like, I think one of the worst parts of Green Bay's defense in this game was their offense, not just the pick six, but the fact sure. that, no, and Rodgers mentioned it as well, like if they would have got some points on the board, then the Patriots have to become one dimensional and it just makes it totally different. I think in today's NFL, when you have pass and run as an option for four quarters plus over time, um, it's very tough to defend because everything's at the opposing offense's disposal. And yes, it's a third string quarterback. It's like, if you would tell any defensive coordinator they get to go against a third string quarterback with six offensive linemen and no explosive playmaker on the outside, you'd be like, sign me the heck up. Oh, also, so, who, by the way, didn't take snaps as a starter in practice all week, was exactly. literally thrown in there cold. So, and then this is exactly what I mentioned at the onset, right? If you can look at different aspects of this defense's performance and be like, oh, okay, like there's a lot to build off of. And then there's right. other parts where you're just like, that 
literally cannot happen and should never happen again. Please don't make it happen again. Well, what's fascinating, because one of the things that you mentioned, the the whole playbook's open at that point for the Patriots, right? Because of the score and the game situation. But what's fascinating to me is that there are so there are so many talented players on the defensive side of the ball for the Packers, yet seemingly almost every single down, someone is messing up or not getting off a block or not making a play that should be readily available to them. And it's shocking to me just going back and watching it like real easy things like an over route. Like it's just an over route. It's nothing complicated. It's not even particularly well run twice yep. by the Patriots where they just leave one time. It's Douglas. One time it's Stokes. Just leave them in their wake. I'm like, guys, and I understand maybe there's a probably maybe some kind of like man match concept and or a zone concept where you're expecting to pass him off, but then they're passing him off to no one. And he's just wide open and four weeks into it. That's a little concerning to me because, again, there's so much talent on that side of the ball. But, man, there is there are seemingly some really bad at times, uh, you know, miscommunication or a lack of communication, which, again, a month in. Yeah, I understand it week one, but a month in, that's concerning. And that would be my biggest concern defensively coming out of this game, right? It's like, this is supposed to be a veteran led defense with a ton of talent, ton of smart people. And we're still seeing coverage breakdowns and that, uh, you know, with Jerry Gray as a very smart defensive backs coach and Joe Barry's been around the block a handful of times, I guess you've got some really veteran defensive players. Like that's the stuff that just can't happen. You've got to get figured out. And then like, you can't just, you just can't get outnumbered up front either. Like, I don't care if they're going six offensive linemen, like figure that out and right. like change up. You have to have counters to that stuff. And I think overall, um, one of the themes for this team has been, uh, an inability to counter quickly enough. I think last week when we saw teams go press man against their offense, uh, they didn't run enough man beaters early, you know, in that second half to kind of come out of that and have success. And then this week, yeah, six offensive linemen. All right, like <laughs> put another defensive lineman out there. Like some of this stuff is it shouldn't be rocket science and they just got to come up with solutions a little bit quicker. I do wonder uh, how much Amos going down very early in this game plays into some of the struggles in, in the secondary and yep. like you said, coverage bus, et cetera. Because he comes up, makes a great play, and then has to take himself out and clearly leaves for the rest of the game. And I do think, from what I've seen, and again, I haven't gotten through all 22 yet, but from what I've seen, uh, Ford and Nixon hold, seem to hold up okay. Yep. But you never really know until you look at kind of like the safety rotation and what the you know kind of development of the routes, married, trying to marry that with whatever the call is defensively. But you know, initial kind of looks, it doesn't seem like they are the ones wildly out of place. So... I do, like I said, I do wonder how much, you know, Amos going down early affected. That. And and certainly no excuse, right? Like the next guys up no. have to be able to capable of, of playing. The standard in is the standard, as Matt always exactly. said. Exactly. But at the same token, too, that's like, you know, I get the third quarterback thing and it's frustrating. This, but like, guess what? Adrian Amos and Jair Alexander are pretty important players on the other side of the ball that Green True. Bay is without, too. And that certainly affected Green Bay in this game. No doubt about it. Let's spin it over to the uh, offensive side of the ball. And. Whew, baby. So they go 13 possessions between the Tampa game and uh, this Patriots game before they score points. When they do, it's great. We're all very excited, very happy. And uh, we'll start with the play of the quarterback because, man, that is the roughest half of football I've seen Aaron Rodgers play in quite some time. And I know people will point to the playoff game. I understood it in the playoff game. Man, the first half of this game, I didn't get at all. I don't know what was going on other than, I mean, a couple times, especially late in the first half, he seemingly zeroed in on the guys he, quote, trusts, whether that's Alan Lazard, whether that's Randall Cobb. They're running all these deep developing routes. He's trying to take solo shots up the sideline or corner routes or what have you. When they had so much success coming out against Tampa with the dinking and dunking, short stuff underneath, et cetera. Man, that it just seemed like he was really pressing. And then, of course, the pick six happens, and, and that was kind of the demarcation line. You have to think some words were had in the locker room, most likely at halftime after that. Yeah, one of the more bizarre halves you've ever seen from Rodgers. And I'm not, like, you know, jumping out of my seat to come to his defense here. I thought offense, they ran the ball well. And I think that's the weirdest thing is that they they just kind of got away from it because when they were running the ball, they ran it well. But I go back and I watch, and – there were certainly some plays where wide receivers were covered up pretty darn well. Offensive line was not holding up in pass protection. Um, didn't think that really anyone had a particularly gr great day in pass protection. Um, and, and certainly some things broke down around him. But 
you have Aaron Rodgers on this team to sort of elevate you through some of those situations. And there were throws that he had at his disposal, even some simple check downs that <laughs> like the ones to Watson, the ones to Jones where he just, dude, dude, I cannot tell you this is, we were talking before we went on here about how I had some deleted tweets last night. <laughs> One of my deleted tweets I will say here was I'm old enough to remember when the Packers fan base was absolutely destroying Jordan love this summer for missing guys in the flat. Guess what? So do four time MVPs which as you just mentioned at least twice in that game yesterday where he absolutely airmails throws one to Watson and one to Jones. And it's like, yeah, it happens. And what was so perplexing too, is like, I thought he was pretty darn awesome in the second half. Like, yeah. And it's not, it's not like I didn't think hundred like, percent turnaround. Totally yeah, it was agree. really was like offense was a nightmare in the first half and uh, really actually pretty darn good in the second half defense fantastic in the first half three points allowed right. turnover like was stopping everything and the second half they allowed the two touchdown drives right away it's just it was a like i go back to it is one of the more bizarre games that i've ever seen and these are the worst games right because you have right. a third string quarterback second string quarterback whatever and like you beat them handily if it's like 38 to you know 13 or something everyone's like that ah, doesn't even matter they didn't have their exactly quarterback they were supposed like, to do they're that. they're supposed right. to do that right. and you get, a, you get a tough win and it's like Oh, it feels like a loss because like they should have beat him by 30. And right. then if you, by, you know, heaven forsake, you actually lose the game. It's like oh. the whole world. That's a nuclear collapsed. meltdown. So, yeah. hundred yeah. percent. It's, it's so the true. worst games. You mentioned um, some of the issues they had in pass pro. Obviously I think one of the most um, noticeable uh, gentlemen in that regard was Elton Jenkins. And I know I put out there like during the game, I was like, man, I'm really starting to feel like Elton came back too early. But the more I look at it, it's like, okay, Judon is a very, very good player. Fair and I think enough. he's going to give a lot of guys trouble throughout his career, this season, et cetera. Because you go back and you watch, and Elton's killing it in the run game. He's he just in those, some of those pass situations, especially like third, eight, and plus, where Judon can really kind of pin his ears back and get after it. Yeah, I think, you know, Elton would be the first one probably to admit he probably didn't have his best game, but it is interesting to watch that kind of develop. And then the questions start getting asked like, all right, do you move him back to guard and have your dominant left side of a line? And then what do you do at tack? Maybe bring Zach Tom on to play right tackle and move Runyon over to right guard. I don't know, but I, I do think the more, and I do think Elton will continue to improve as the year goes on. It gets further and further away from that injury. But I do think if there are continued struggles there, because it's not like he was lights out, these first couple of weeks either. Um, I think those conversations will start to kind of bubble to the surface in Green Bay a little bit. I think so too. And I think it's also worth noting that while I'm, I'm fairly certain that their, their goal and their hope was to play out in that right tackle. It, it we don't hundred percent know, because I, I think they had to keep Yash at left because of Bakhtiari situation and like right. flipping them in and out. And like, Maybe if they felt Bakhtiari was 100% healthy, maybe they move Yash at right tackle through the entire, entirety of this offseason and say, all right, Yash is going to be right. And now we're going to put Elton at left and running at right or just Elton at right or like, you know, figure something different out. So I think if Bakhtiari can show that he's 100% back and can play a full game week after week, you know, for the next few weeks, maybe they do take a closer look at Yash at right tackle and move um, Jenkins inside. I think it's funny. So, Pro Football Focus actually had a, a positive grade on on uh, Ni or on um, Jenkins this week, uh, and I think they actually did last week too, which I don't understand. Um, I uh, I had actually my lowest grade on offense the last two weeks was on Elton Jenkins, and of course nobody wanted to hear about it. And I get like you have some forgiveness for him because he's back from injury, thirty three snap. But you still can that. only judge between about what you see between the exactly. White lines. So, but 100%. like of course nobody wants to hear that. And then like this week, I'm like run blocking. I thought he was really freaking good for the majority of the game. Pass blocking right. obviously had a few plays here and there, but I actually thought he settled in better than he did over the last two weeks to the point where like, I'm almost like, okay, like let's give this a couple more. You can weeks. see it developing. Yeah. Exactly, that makes right? sense. That makes so, sense. Like I I'm, I'm all for it. Like I, I tweeted today as well. Like I think you can make an argument that Elton at left guard over Runyon is an improvement that Runyon over Newman at right guard is an improvement. An improvement right? And the difference between Yash right now and Elton at right tackle right now may actually not be that different because Elton's had some struggles through three weeks. So you can make a strong argument that that's their best line. I'm not going to argue against it, but I also saw some signs out of uh, Elton for the first time in the three weeks where I'm like, okay, maybe this could work if he can just get a little bit more technique work at right tackle. 
Let's broaden our horizons a little bit here and look at the uh, perimeter group, the wide receivers. Uh, it's fun to watch Romeo Dobbs catch footballs. It's fun to watch Christian Watson do Lambeau leaps. I cannot begin to express how excited I am for both of these young men. And I know, yes, the end, the last play, the last, you know, the touchdown that wasn't by yeah. Dobbs. It's a tough play. Bang, bang. Yes, it, it absolutely think I think was adjudicated correctly as far as, yes, I thought it was incomplete. Yep. But man, how can you not watch that game and get excited? I, I just, everything about these two and the fact that we're only four weeks in, who knows where, you know, the rest of this season goes. I thought both of them played well. It was great to see, obviously, Watson get in the end zone. Let's hope they uh, keep trying to probe things downfield because I loved his, actually his route when he came off the motion and then went up the sideline and Rogers, you know, misses him a little bit outside. I, I agree with Tony Romo on the call and the broadcast. You'd like to see him like adjust to that a little bit Trust better, that, yeah. but at the same time with the route itself, he does a good job of leaving cushion there. Like a lot of guys, I think you'd see, especially young kids, you'd see him run to the sideline and then turn it up or like get closer to the sideline and then turn it up. He leaves a lot of area there for Rogers to drop it in. So it's little things like that where those are encouraging signs. He clearly Hasn't played a whole lot of football yet. So I think the sky's the limit. And again, for both of these dudes, man, you are so jazzed watching that game and thinking, okay, this is just the beginning. The 2022 versions of Watson, Dobbs, and uh, Quay Walker are not too shabby already. Right. I'm so excited about like 2024 Quay Walker, 2024 <laughs> Romeo Dobbs, and 2024 Christian Watson. Like, I think all three of those guys have the ability to be tremendous, tremendous football players. And uh, like you see the, the, the raw athleticism, you see it come out in spurts in ridiculous ways of just plays that like most guys can't make. You see things from Romeo Dobbs already that you're like, we've, we've seen that before. Like we've yeah, seen that from right. some very special players <laughs> in green Bay before. And yeah, there's going to be a legitimate learning curve and some real legitimate hiccups along the way with all of those guys. They're rookies. They're playing their first NFL snaps. They're all in pretty, especially Dobbs and Walker right now in pretty significant roles on each, on each side of the ball. So th there's, there's going to be some mistakes along the way, but man, you, you are willing to live with it because you know, as time goes on, those mistakes are going to, you know, going to become less and less and the highlight plays are going to become more and more. And I guarantee you, like Watson game one, that, that play against Minnesota, he's going to make that play next time. Dobbs, that play in the end zone that he's got in, in this game, he's going to make that next time. Quay Walker, same thing. Like they're, they're just all three immensely talented, and I cannot wait to see what these guys look like by end of this year, next year, the year after that, that they're all going to be studs in my opinion. And speaking of pass catchers, it was nice to see uh, Tunyon get involved again and that seam ball through to the end zone and, it is interesting to look at snap counts and see that, you know, he's not even close to playing a full game yet as far as like how many times they have him out there. And I am really interested in the usage of Tyler Davis. Like it was so funny. I remember all the negative energy around this kid in camp because of some rough preseason uh, yep. games. And now he's playing a lot and they're using him kind of in line a lot, but then kind of leaking him out at times for at some you know, capacity as a pass catcher it to me that is really interesting just to see how they really must i think they view him as the backup to tunyon whereas deguara is very clearly just kind of their move guy when they yeah. require a move tight end in whatever call they're using but man davis is getting a lot of run in kind of you know his role as letting tunyon kind of ease back into action yeah, I really like seeing the the touchdown to Bobby touchdowns once again. That was, I feel like, something that I think even he needed a little bit. Right. Um, I, I'm I'm really curious, and this is actually a topic that I wanted to go into in, in greater detail at some point, but I want to get your thoughts as well. I think they have answers along the offensive line um, for this season. I think they have answers at wide receiver. I really do. I think Lazard, Dobbs, Watson, Cobb, I think those guys with protection up front are going to be just fine. I, th I think they're, those guys are going to continue to get better as a group. And we'll see what, you know, when Sammy Watkins comes back, et cetera. <clears throat> Tight end is to me the big one where like, I, I know what you get from Mercedes and I like what you get from Mercedes. Tunyon does not look the same with the ball in his hands right now. Like, you know, yep. he catch ball, he's tackled. Yep. Like he's not going to make anyone miss. He's not running through anybody. And maybe as the year goes on and, um, you know, get a, he, a little burst back. I mean, maybe, you know, it's maybe, under right? a year since that 
injury. Yep. So and we yeah, see that all the time. Even Deguara last year, we didn't see him gain some of his speed back till the end of last year. Right. So like maybe that comes, but like to me, for all the talk for I don't know ever now, like they got to get more wide receivers. They got to get like they don't have enough wide receivers. Like to me. I actually think it's more of like they they need a weapon at tight end that they can stretch the seam a little bit more. And this maybe this is the first step for Tanyan. Um, but I to me that's that's a question mark that I don't know that they have an answer to. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely spot on. It is interesting. It's kind of an island of misfit toys at the tight end position, right? There's yep. lots of people that can do lots of different things, but no one guy that does everything well. Which Agreed. is you know fine. You're not you can't be stacked at every position. Exactly. I get it. Like, but yes, I think that's certainly something they'll be kind of looking at. Probably this off season. I don't think they make any kind of move in season. But can you uh, imagine a move in season like that? Whoa, like whoa, 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 whoa. Let's uh, let's come back from the la la land because that ain't gonna <laughs> happen. Now watch. We'll we'll get off this and and there'll be news like the Packers have made a trade. Exactly. Whatever. Can't wait. Um. Hey, real quick before we go, special teams not quite as special this week, but uh, for the most part, I thought they held up pretty well. Against the Bill Belichick coach team that specializes in special teams and puts a ton of emphasis on it for years. Yeah. The fact that there were no egregious mistakes or errors, I think, is still a, a win this week. And you know, Nixon had the ball down at the what one or two yard line. Yeah. Uh, and so a couple flash plays here and there. And I think also like the fact that Nixon and, and Rudy Ford have to play the whole game on defense, I think certainly affects your special teams a little bit as well. So overall, I thought the adjustments were good and you know, hopefully they can get their guys back on defense sooner rather than later. So those guys can focus a little bit more on special teams. I will say though, I, 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 I talked about tonight. I, Amari Rogers, I, I don't know. Ooh, I, I don't maybe. like yeah. there's, get there's North and I, South young man. He doesn't have the speed to get around the edge. That's the I don't thing, know what right? he's trying to prove. Like just get up field. There's the play. What's his last name? Schooler. The, the, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. So he comes down and it's just one-on-one with like, not exactly the fastest safety in the world coming down the field and Schooler kind of breaks down. Right. Yeah. He does. So absolutely does. Comes to back as a returner. Yep. If you, if the guys like some guys in this league as returners, this might surprise some people, the Devin <laughs> Duvernay's and whatever, if they are, if the other guy has an angle on them, they can still beat that angle because right. they are a juicy, saucy nope. returner. Amari Rogers had him one on one, and his feet were planted in the ground. And Amari Rogers tried to make, I don't know, maybe what you would consider a move, and then goes left, and right. scores just right. like takes him down immediately. Like that, that can't happen for you. It's returner. like he tried to give him a shake and bake rather I, than just put his foot, just put and your just go. foot in the ground, young man. Yeah, I know. I feel you. And as Rogers said, I don't know. He's returning for us now. That's all I got. I, I don't know. Man. I don't know. I mean, look, who knows? The Amari Rogers saga is like incredible to watch as far as like he got zero snaps. We went back to zero snaps on offense. Yep. Um, he's returning, but not doing it well. Man, I think getting Randall Cobb back in the fold right after they drafted Amari Rogers, I think it absolutely decimated Rogers' chance of making much of an impact on this football team. I because mean, everything right. they would ever ask him to do, Randall Cobb is doing. And doing well, yeah. by the way. Or not I think Randall Cobb is too. Like in well, more of that uh, well as the play. Jet guy, especially. Yeah. I mean, you saw when Watson was out, Amari was getting at least two or three of those snaps. But now yeah. Watson's there, and forget it. Which I again, I understand. So Watson's like big and strong and explosive and fast, and yeah, oh yeah, it's the dude I want. But exactly, poor Amari, man. That's it's a he's in a tough spot. But we'll see. Now next week in London, he'll break a big one. I, I feel it. I'm calling it right now. It's going to happen. I hope you're right. Can't wait. Uh, Andy, I can't thank you enough each and every week. Talking ball the day after the game. I hope we can do it next week. I don't know what my schedule will be and or the time zone difference. Uh, I'll be in London. So nice. hopefully Enjoy. I'm going to have the time of my life. You kidding me? But hopefully <laughs> we'll figure out a, a, a way to do this and uh, get it up. If not, like right away, maybe later in the week. But it'll definitely happen because I need my therapy with Andy Herman. I'm, I was going to say, I'm glad people listen to this because even if they didn't, like if we had zero viewership, I think I would be like, can we still do this anyway? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I kind of, I, th I think I kind of need this. Just need our session every week. <laughs> Absolutely. Andy, I can't thank you enough. Make sure you check out Andy's stuff at Packer Day Podcast, Packer Report, and everywhere you can find Packer stuff on the internet. That's what he does. He covers this team like a blanket. <laughs> Andy, can't thank you enough, man. Thanks, Aaron. Have a good one.